Today we are going to discuss experimentation statistics with Georgi Georgiev, owner of the digital agency WebFocus from Bulgaria, creator of the analytics suite analytics-toolkit.com and the author of the book Statistical Methods in Online A-B Testing alongside many other white papers and articles on this subject. My name is Guido Janssen and welcome to Shiro Cafe, the podcast where I show you the behind the scenes of optimization teams and talk with their specialists about data and human-driven optimization and implementing a culture of experimentation and validation. In case you missed it, in the previous English episode I spoke with Ruben de Boer from Online Dialogue and we discussed how you can motivate your organization to adopt Shiro. You can listen to that episode on the Shiro Cafe website or in the podcast app that you're listening with right now. This episode of Shiro Cafe is made possible by our partners Online Dialogue, Sidespect, Online Influence Institute, Content Square, and Convert.com. Welcome to Season 2, Episode 30. Yogi, welcome to the cafe, and can you give us a short introduction of your journey into Shiro? Thank you for the question, Guido. Uh, well, it's been a long journey for me, actually. I started as a digital marketer, uh, doing uh, SEO, doing uh, AdWords management, and uh, actually building and managing websites. And I obviously become aware of uh, analytics very, very early and the utility of it. And uh, so in the course of my career, I actually transitioned more into this data analyst role over time. But I didn't have like much training in uh, statistical analysis of data of any kind. So I was soon hitting limitations where I would be looking at data and not being sure of how to interpret it. I would uh, so many times look at uh, some trend or some uh, level change in, in, let's say, yeah. bounce rate or number of visits from some traffic source. And I would be like, okay, but how do I know this is not like part of the usual fluctuation of the data that I see on a daily or weekly basis? And even if it isn't part of that fluctuation, how do I attribute causes to, to that? How, how are I connected to underlying causes? And that's been a major driver for me to actually start exploring, exploring uh, statistics, um, design of experiments and all that. Just the desire to, to be able to connect causes with effects or, you know, the vice versa if, uh, if at all possible. I, th- I think a lot of people recognize those, those challenges that you have. But I don't think a lot of people like you dive into statistics, uh, like naturally dive into that, uh, uh, like you did. So, w- what what made you think? Okay, let's 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 just do this. Let's 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 become the expert uh, in in online uh, analytics and statistics. Well, for me, it wasn't much of a choice. I mean, once you really <laughs> look into the details of what can you get out of just observational data, and then when you understand the power of just to rank an experiment. And it, it, it's just nowhere near. I mean, it, it's just a necessity to run an experiment if you really need a causal link. And yeah. uh, so it's just a non-question for me. If you really need solid um, understanding of what's happening, then you, you run experiments and you need to know the stats behind that because uh, otherwise you would be running experiments, but then the results won't be uh, speaking to you what they they could. I mean, you would be fooled by randomness, as uh, you know, one book title goes, uh, quite often, even with experiments. Yeah, so, and, and like 15, 20 years ago, we needed to run experiments by ourselves or run statistical models on that by ourselves and, and, and check all the uh, uh, variables um, and set those ourselves. But nowadays we have a, a, a range of A-B testing tools uh, and those tools neatly tell us uh, this is the winner, this is the loser. Um, so a lot of people starting out in this field might assume, okay, that's this is the winner, this is the loser, period. So why do you think it's still important to have uh, statistical knowledge about what's happening if those tools just tell us what's happening anyway? Uh, right, yeah. I mean, we're, <laughs> we're really blessed. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a complex question, but I'll try to answer it succinctly. So we're really blessed in the online marketing field and uh, usability field because we really have these awesome tools. And while the browsers are still, you know, allowing some kind of tracking to go through, uh, we, we do have amazing abilities to um, measure uh, so many metrics for pretty much all of our uh, website traffic. And that's obviously a huge advantage we have uh, over, let's say, scientists in psychology, consumer behavior, or, you know, even some of the hard disciplines like physics. 
And that's all great, but unless you understand the rationale behind uh, the statistical models and the, um, the, the the design the design parameters of the experiments that you're running, it's going to be very hard for you to make sense of what you see. And in particular, it's going to be very hard to design uh, efficient tests because most of the tools out there, and I mean, I'm even gonna go out on a limb here and say all of the tools out there, none of them are pretty much um, give you the parameters that you need to design efficient tests. And it, it, statistics and experiments, it, it's all about efficient use of data. But how do you define efficiency? That's the problem most people face and they start to, start to wonder, um, to ask questions like, okay, uh, how long should I run this test for? What should my uh, level of uncertainty uh, be? What's, what's the acceptable uncertainty of uh, the result from this experiment? And, uh, you know, these are the two basic questions, but then there are auxiliary ones, such as, uh, should I run uh, just one variant versus a control, or should I run 10 versus a control just to, you know, have a better chance of finding out what works best? Or... Um, you know, should I be looking at the data on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, or should I just, you know, start and then uh, examine it at the end? And the question just pile up once you start digging into into it. And without understanding the the reasoning behind the stats, you really will be um, subject to this one, um, you know, one solution fits all problems approach, which really doesn't work. So, for example, if we, if you're a startup and you're testing something which is probably going to be live on your website for six to twelve months, does it really make sense to run with these standards of let's let's say ninety five or ninety nine percent significance and maybe very high power for a very small effect size? And a test that takes let's say three or four months or maybe even six months to run with these parameters, it doesn't really make sense to do that. And at the same time, if you are a big company. Uh, with like uh, very um, very well established processes, very well established products, it doesn't really make sense to run with these parameters either, because for many tests you would actually need much higher uh, levels of certainty before you can act. Um, and yeah, that's that's something that people easily fall into if don't if they don't understand the uh, reasoning behind. So they would fall into this. Um, black box solutions which are really just one size fits all yeah that's not what you want you know even within a company or within a company unit or over time each test would be different each test would uh, require different parameters to make the most efficient uh, way of getting to a decision and unless you understand the reasoning behind uh, behind it you you know, the two will always recommend the same thing over and over. Like at the moment, to give you an example, I'm running uh, a series of AI tests with Google Optimize. And <laughs> I mean, uh, none of the first 15 tests stopped within 32 days of uh, running those. So I, if I'm like a startup looking to make an agile change, I would be waiting for over a month without any kind of decision. And I'm actually planning to let the rest of the tests run for whatever, however long they take, just to see, okay, how long would it take Google Optimize to stop these tests? Because yeah. it becomes ridiculous at, at some point, like it, it's unnecessarily long. And that's a product of their imposing their standards on every single test run on their platform. Um, and that's that, I mean, not, not singling out Google Optimize here. That's something that um, many other tools do. And even the ones that they that, that give you some opportunity to alter these parameters, uh, if you don't know what you're doing, how are you going to alter them in an informed manner? You're just going to be like a blind man <laughs> trying to feel their way around, so trial and error, and that's, that's going to take forever. Yesterday's brainstorm was so good. I really liked Steph's idea of running that test on the call to action buttons. Making them orange will really make them stand out, don't you think? Yeah, right. Do you want to design real A-B test winners and achieve enormous conversion uplift? Then stop brainstorming and take a scientific approach. If you can read Dutch, follow the steps in Online Influence, the bestseller on managementbook.nl. Or enroll in the author's course and become an expert in applying proven behavioral science yourself. Go to onlineinfluence.com for more information and free downloads. When doing this, when running experiments, inherently there's there's um, 
there's there are unknown things. We we um, uh, accept a certain risk that we make a wrong decision, um, um, and while managers of a lot of CRO teams or digital marketing teams, they just want answers. They just want certainty that something will work or doesn't work. So how how would you respond to that? Well, I would say there is a, always a cost, always a trade-off associated with certainty. And for example, statistical significance uh, re requiring higher levels of certainty there limits your post-test risks. So after you implement, uh, let's say you have a winner and you, you, you implement, but it significantly increases the, the duration of the test. And so it increases the risks during testing. So if you're actually what you're testing is actually worse than uh, your control or your incumbent solution, then you're going to be incurring these costs over the duration of the test. And in the in a similar manner, uh, let's say, uh, requiring a higher statistical power, so that's a higher probability to detect actual effects, uh, that's also going to have, um, you know, this limiting effect on your gains. So, uh, testing that, that would basically require you to test for longer, just like increasing statistical significance would. And, you know, uh, if what you're testing is actually better than the control, uh, that's a longer time period in which you're not reaping the benefits from that improved solution. So that these trade-offs, they need to be explained to marketers. They need to be explained to higher-ups. And I think most people have an intuitive understanding of that, which, you know, might be uh, misleading in some cases, but with a little bit of examples, with a little bit of work that can be overcome. I think uh, one tool to do that are AA tests. Uh, I think it's great to just run a couple of AA tests and maybe not even tell your colleagues that, that these are AA tests, just say, yeah, we're running these two or three AB tests here, uh, testing some ideas for X team. And then, uh, you can just present them the results and say, okay, would you like to implement based on this data? And uh, when they say yeah or no, and then you can say, yeah, but that's actually an AI test. So <laughs> there's nothing to implement. And, you know, situations like that, obviously it's a little bit hard to, rep to replicate that. Um, but I think even just looking at the data and uh, how it changes over time would help people get this intuitive understanding of variability, um, which is not not so not so innate for us simply because most times like we we, we live in a world with fixed uh properties so if i drop my phone on the ground it's gonna fall like 100 percent of the time um so you know yeah, we are not used to to dealing with probabilities but that's something that needs to be explained. So we... you mentioned uh, some people have a, an, an innate sense of this, an intuition of, of how this works, uh, which might not actually um, um, be true in, <laughs> when we talk about the uh, A-B test. But do you think we, we can teach teams or, or the managers of those teams uh, this experimentation mindset? Is, is that teachable or is it... Is it all a waste of time? I definitely uh, think it's teachable. Uh, as I mentioned, AA tests, that's one way to do it. Another is to just examine cases where they didn't experiment, where they just went in, went on with it and implemented, and then uh, they had uh, uh, horrible consequences. And that happens, I think, often enough that you will have plenty of opportunities to do that. Uh, I've actually shared one such example from our own website. And just the other day, we had one other such, uh, <laughs> like, uh, one other such disaster where we've lost a lot of money because uh, we were too quick to implement um, based on, I'm going to say, it's related to uh, AdSense policy compliance. And we were just, okay, mm -hmm. yeah, we, we have to implement this. Uh, we need to be compliant. Uh, push it live, you know, there's no, no no point of discussion here. And two months later, I'm looking at the data and I think uh, it's our decline is due to um, the virus epidemic situation, but no, it's just our own uh, stupidity. Let's, so let's put it briefly. <laughs> so, basically, so basically what you're saying is uh, let them make mistakes. That's, that's the best learning uh, uh, they can probably have. I think mistakes will be there. Just take take the opportunity to explain how these mistakes could have been uh, prevented with a very high probability yeah. if there were tests in place, if there were procedures to test every decision. And um, 
I think that that's that's something that people don't really understand when they go into testing. Most of the time, unless they ha- they know the statistical side of things, they think that they are testing ideas. But the truth is, they are not. They are testing particular implementations of ideas. And even if the idea is great, the implementation could be broken or could be suboptimal and might have no effect or even a negative effect. And sometimes even a bad idea, like a bad reasoning for why you're doing something might lead to a really great user experience, which actually improves sales for reasons other than the ones that you initially went with. So I think, um, yeah, a mistakes are a good opportunity to explain how that uh, that might have been. Yeah, I think that's that's a good point. You 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 need you need a, a proper hypothesis, and you probably need multiple experiments to to test to, to validate that hypothesis, right? It's not not one experiment, and then uh, you can validate your ID. You already know certain or uh, that your ID is working, yes or no. No, it, it might be that particular implementation that you just happen to use and not necessarily uh, validate uh, that exact ID. Exactly. So, for example, um, with your background in psychology, you might have like a certain idea of how consumer behavior might be influenced or uh, assisted in a positive manner. And, you know, you can come up with one test to one one implementation, one uh, particular uh, way of changing your website or your checkout experience or whatever. Uh, to test that, but maybe you've overlooked some other factor there. So if you're really testing the idea of um, this psychological mechanism will help us, then you will definitely need a bunch of tests, uh, trying it at different stages of the website, maybe trying it with different messaging, with different visuals, uh, just because sometimes it's it's, uh, the implementation which is more important than the idea it has a a swamping effect on the actual, uh, you know, that there, there might be underlying true effects and then there might be a negative effect from the implementation itself. Yeah. And also sometimes, I mean, testing tools are not perfect. Sometimes there would be issues with the testing setup itself. So even if the idea is good, even if the implementation is good, uh, the test is poorly uh, set up for whatever reason. There are some measurement issues and you still get biased results, uh, meaning that they don't reflect the underlying rea- reality. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so you work with uh, several companies uh, doing this. Do you see certain I don't know, companies or verticals or, or people being exceptionally uh, good at this or way worse <laughs> at, at doing this, at, at, at uh, accepting this mindset? Yeah, I would say so. Um, I think kind of, Naturally, digital companies or data-driven companies like businesses, which are data-driven by by, the, by their core, are much quicker to um, to get on the A/B testing train simply because they've had a lot of experience with uh, observational data and they are keenly aware of the dangers of over-interpreting what uh, the data says, and um, they are very quick to recognize. Okay, if we can run a test. Uh, an actual controlled experiment that's going to be much, much better than just uh, looking at some uh, data and analytics, let's say. Um, so, yeah, I think these companies that traditionally have used data or where data is their core business, they are very quick to, to come to grasp yeah. with it. Um, and then on the other side, I think it's... Uh, it's e-commerce e-commerce companies, then lead gen companies, and then publishers and like uh, yeah, publishers in general. Uh, that's the scale I would put it in. Um, simply because e-commerce that, that's like an like an order in which the most proficient and most uh, quick to adopt heavy testing to least yeah. uh, simply because uh, I think it's uh, partly um, I think of having the data, uh, the ability to measure for e-commerce uh, websites. Uh, it's um, very the conversion point is completely online yes, right yes. and um, so the, the closer your conversion is and if it's completely online the easier it is to uh, adopt that exactly it's much easier to come up with metrics um, that are both measurable and actionable and speak to the business uh, bottom line whereas for publishers it's much harder because for example let's say you're optimizing for click through rate of a title well, uh, on some level, you know, higher click to rate is always better, but there are situations where that's not necessarily the case. And um, sometimes, you know, there are, well, let's say, let's say that your most clickbaity content 
actually um, draws in the least um, advertisers of uh, the lowest quality. So they would have the lowest bids there for, for their ads. And so you might be increasing your number of impressions by, let's say, twofold. But at the same time, if that inc- decreases your average uh, revenue per million by um by, by by some per, per million, I'm sorry by by some uh, margin then you might actually be losing money by by increasing your impressions so there there are these difficulties that I think are part of the reason why such companies are usually slower to adapt to a data driven approach Fightspec offers a worldwide unique a b testing personalization and product recommendation solution Sidespec works service side without any tags or scripts which guarantees an optimal performance. The Sidespec solution eliminates delays and the chance of any flickering effects, and this approach also ensures that the current and future browser security rules like ITP and ETP don't make an impact on your A-B testing and personalizations. For more info, visit sidespec.com. Do you also see a, a difference in this, this kind of risk management, management between um, um, established businesses and, and startups? Sure, sure. Yeah. And um, I think this this speaks to my previous point about one size fits all solutions. And so let's say you're a startup, you're much more agile than a well-established mature business with thousands of employees, let's say, and you can turn on, turn on a dime. Um, you're happy to, to, to implement high risk solutions simply because, you know, even if it doesn't work, you can just pivot. And um, (laughs) obviously the testing environment there would be much more agile, much more, uh, you know, maybe the risk of missing a true effect would be even uh, of higher priority than the risk of breaking something, you know, uh, especially in those very early stages. Whereas for a mature company, um, the equation usually goes the, the other way. And also another major difference is the period during which whatever you do will persist. So for a startup, the, you, you might you know, have a horizon of uh, six months, 12 months, or even two years, but that's, that's rare. So what you do now will stay and have an effect for, let's say, a year. But for a um, you know, mature company, some things that you do might be there for 10 years or 15 years even, let's say. I mean, uh, software from the Microsoft Office suit. I mean, how many drastic changes do you see there over the past 10 years? Not that many, right? And so yeah. uh, the stakes are higher and uh, so the risk is, is larger there. And I think that's that's one of the major differences. Do you also see a, a difference uh, or maybe sh- do you think there should be a difference in, in the objectives um, of, of how those uh, companies run experiments between, for example, startups and, and more established businesses? Um, objectives... I'm not sure. I'm not sure about objectives. I think from the business side, they should be mostly the same. I think it, in one point of the life of a startup, you start measuring different things and caring about different things. Let's say if initially you're all about acquisition, at one point you need to transition to um, retainment of existing user bases, existing clients. Yeah. And that's maybe one of the biggest changes that, that, that happens. And it brings with it a whole lot of um, new metrics and new types of experiments to run. Um, I think other than that, uh, no, the objectives should be fairly fairly sim- similar. Okay. And and for, uh, for startups, I can imagine, uh, like you said uh, earlier, um, uh, some, sometimes it might... As a startup, you don't have a lot of data, maybe not enough data to, to run the experiment you want to run. Uh, maybe you do. And, and, and sometimes you say, okay, but we're maybe previous, uh, like offline research already told you something and you're going to implement something anyway. Would you still advise companies then to, to run an A-B test or run an experiment to validate that? Or if, you, if you're going to implement it anyway? Yes, uh, sure. Because... Um just the simple fact that the given approach works for others uh, doesn't mean that it will work for you. And furthermore, even if it works, uh, speaking to what previously uh, what we previously covered, your implementation might be faulty or might be uh, yeah. significantly different, even if you don't think it is. So it might be a simple layout thing or simple cover thing or simple wording um, 
difference that actually <laughs> it was what what made it work for those like 10 other companies and you're taking yeah. their experience but it's not necessarily the experience and i mean i think you know that from psychology experiments where context is uh, highly you know the some of them are highly sensitive to context and so uh, results won't replicate under mild variations of the context that turn out to be substantial to, to have substantial effects yeah I, I lately um had a company they wanted to um, so they were working on a new design of their uh, website and they um as an example they were a big fan of uh, one of the larger um, uh, clothing companies in the, in the Netherlands um, uh, doing this online, but they were selling bicycles. Like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow! That's, that's, yeah. th there's there's a, there's I expect there to be a difference <laughs> in how people purchase um, uh, like uh, twenty dollar t shirts or two thousand uh, dollar um, um, uh, bicycles. Exactly, and also there is the difference between the. Uh, consumer oriented versus business to business uh, bi uh, yeah. projects. So, for example, one test we did was informed by, okay, can we be more aggressive with our um, purchase button wording? And it turns out we can only go so much because we are B two B, and it just doesn't really make sense to to be aggressive as you would be with some like really um, like spur of the moment purchase types of. Uh, uh, items so yeah you just mentioned that um that there's a difference between uh, how companies are suited to to run experiments and uh, we, we kind of est established that the the closer the the metric is your your business metric is to what you can actually measure the better it is uh, for you so for e-commerce the purchase is online that's something you can measure within your analytics uh so that's 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 a positive thing uh for uh, more like news websites, those metrics are more long-term uh, or or even offline. Uh, so it's harder to measure. So you have um, um, metrics that try to indicate a positive uh, um, uh, behavior, like click-through rate on a, on a title, uh, like you mentioned. But it, I mean, you don't necessarily want people to click on your title. You want them to read the article, to click on the advertisements, and and so on. Um, but also, even for, for e-commerce, um, just one purchase might not be the optimal way to optimize, uh, the optimal metric to optimize for. So how do you ad advise companies to, to pick their, the metric that they're actually using? So for e-commerce, for me, it sounds logical to more look at like li lifetime value. Um, if they even <laughs> know what their lifetime value is from for their customers, um, so there's there's a wide range of what you can pick as an, uh, as a metric to optimize for. It can be click through rate, very simple, very straightforward. Um, don't need a lot of traffic for that. On the other hand, the other end of the spectrum can be lifetime value, um, but it might take a very long time to run an experiment, even if I have this uh, metric. Some companies don't even have that. Um, so what, what is, what's your advice for companies on, on picking a metric to optimize for? Uh, my first piece of advice would be to not be, for, um, to not be going for convenience. So most of the literature, most of the examples out there, most of the tools out there are pretty happy to help you calculate conversion rate statistics and to run tests based on conversion rate as a primary, um, me measurement. It's, it's, it's like the name of our industry, right? Conversion yes, rate exactly. optimization. <laughs> exactly. And that's also the metric which uh, clients would be most uh, comfortable with, you know, yeah. they will be familiar with it. Um, so that's a trap of convenience and that's something yeah. you should avoid. And the reason is, uh, as you said, you know, the closer the metric is to your business bottom line, the easier it is to interpret it into, okay, do we, do we actually want to make this decision or um, do we actually need more data to do it? And we come to the dreaded trade-off keyword <laughs> here. So it's a trade-off. If you go by conversion rate, you will know something about the rate at which users purchase, but you will be missing information of how many items did they purchase, what these items are worth. And then if you have some kind of, as, as you mentioned, lifetime value model, uh, what's the um, you know probable like lifetime value of those uh, new customers let's say they are new and uh yeah with conversion rate you can go quicker but you have 
um, less information to act on. So it's actually um, the, the, the trade-off is pretty pretty much um, it, it, it's a constant thing. There is no shortcuts. That's something I've been trying to yeah. instill in my readers for a long time that yeah, there, if it looks too good to be true, it's too good to be true. If it <laughs> says that you can run the test in two weeks instead of uh, two months, uh, it's probably trading off something somewhere. And if you don't understand what it is, you're in danger because then you might be making decisions uh, based on information, which doesn't really mean what you think it means. And that could be worse than not doing experiments at all. In some cases, simply because you would make the change. You think, yeah, this is solid. So we've tested it, it works. And then if your observational data following the implementation says otherwise, you would be much less inclined to question that decision because, I mean, it was tested, right? So it has to be something else. Uh, Marketing budgets have suffered and the share for A-B testing has been impacted too. If you want to keep testing to enterprise standards, but save 80% on your annual contract, you can consider convert.com. With their summer release, you can take advantage of full stack and hybrid features, strong privacy compliance, no blink, and enterprise great security. Feel good about your smart business decision. Invest what you save back in your zero program. Check out www.convert.com slash 2020. So am I right to assume that um, if you don't have a lot of data, like with most most startups, uh, you you look at the trade-off and say, okay, well, let's, let's um, uh, go for the, the, the easier things or things that we can at least uh, uh, test for, we can we can validate for, like, like maybe uh, we need to optimize for click-through rate. Uh, and then the more mature you get, the more data you get as a company, uh, the further away um, uh, the metric is uh, in, in your business life cycle that you um, uh, the, that then that's the one you pick uh, to optimize for it. So you go from uh, conversion rates uh, of, uh, of of click through rates to conversion rates for maybe your newsletter to conversion rate of uh, actual orders to uh, actual lifetime value. Is that is that a right assumption there? Yeah. No, I would actually not recommend that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to disappoint, but yeah, I, I, my, my understanding is that you should use the best metric that you have available, but you yeah. should alter your expectation about the uncertainty with which you would need to act. So if yeah. the metric is, um, if you can measure average order value, uh, sorry, average revenue per user, then yeah, it's if it takes you like three months to get to 95% uh, significance, then yeah, you can say, okay, we three months is way too long. It doesn't make sense for us to test for that long. Yeah. Uh, we should test for just two months, but we will be happy to accept, let's say, 90% uh, significance threshold as a decision, um, you know, threshold. And I think that's the, the more the more honest approach, if you will, because this way you're still measuring what you really want to measure. And that's question number one. Yeah. And only it's in the second place, do you uh, start to specify the design of the experiment, which includes things like the statistical significance, the power, the minimum effect of interest and all that. So first you should be measuring what really matters to, your, to the business, what is easy to interpret without, um, without doubts, because let's say you achieve an improvement in uh, conversion rate. Well, uh, is it because, uh, is, is it actually positive for the business? You can't really say unless you also look at average order value. And uh, once you do that, you're actually looking at average revenue per user, which is just the product of the two. And so what are we doing here? Like you're, you're if you do that, you're likely uh, lying to yourself. So you're saying uh, you, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't make concessions on the metric. The metric should be, uh, should be pretty much uh, the same uh, throughout your uh, life cycle of the company. That that should be uh, a fixed thing and the, the the best thing you can measure. And uh, that that connects with your with, with your business goals. Uh, but but do uh, do those concessions on uh, confidence level or um, uh, significance? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think this way it's easier for everyone involved: um, testers, uh, usability experts, uh, higher ups. To understand what's actually going on because otherwise if they're smart they're they're going to start asking these questions okay conversion rate is up but <laughs> what about average order value what about you know our revenue at the end and inevitably your results will be interpreted as if they 
pertain to the um, business metric which uh, your higher-ups care about. And believe me, most of them are not measured by conversion rate. They are measured by the money in the bank. <laughs> and yeah, yeah. so, yeah, the closer you can be to that, the the better. Yeah, and it, it, um, and it can also be uh, different for different business units or different countries that you're in, depending on the situation, right? On, or depending on the strategy of the company. Uh, I, I once worked for um, a company selling flowers online. Uh, and in some companies, uh, so, sorry, so in some countries, uh, they were the market leader. So then you want to optimize for profit. Uh, you're already the market leader, so that's that's fine. You don't necessarily want to uh, uh, massively expand your, uh, uh, your your customer base because it's already the largest that there is. But if you're a challenger in the country, in the country, you might even be fine with losing money for certain. Maybe you, for the next two years, you're fine with. Uh, playing break even, uh, not not making any profit at all, but it's the, still the business that needs to decide on those strategies. Not A/B testing is not going to give you an answer on that. Absolutely, absolutely. And there are also businesses where, let's say, uh, time is essential. So maybe you're in the food business uh, or, or something else where, if you don't sell the item, it's gonna basically rot <laughs> it's going to lose your it's, its value completely yeah. so you have different things to consider but that should all go into the metric like as uh, uh, that, that's the uh, idea for Ronnie to have his overall evaluation criterion uh, so it should encompass these things ideally uh, it could be a composite metric it could be one single you know number which uh, combines different metrics but yeah the metric yeah. comes first and then you try to estimate its uncertainty in the most cost-efficient way available to you, yeah. and that's that's where statistics come in. Yeah, my my advice to uh, to digital teams when, when picking their metric is usually to ignore whatever the digital team is doing, but but go over to the finance team or the CFO and ask them what they are looking for. That's a great advice um, because then then you know what the, the company and the management is actually seeing. You can you can try optimize for that. That's a great advice, Guido. Uh, so you you mentioned um, uh, testing for two or three months. I think that's a that's a hot uh, uh, debated topic in the CRO industry. How long to run tests for? <laughs> so what's your what's your answer to that? How how long should I run a test? Um, it, I mean, it's limited, of course. Uh, to um, you you say we can make concessions to to the significance level, um, but do we also make concessions in in how long we can run the test? Is there a maximum or a minimum? Yeah, sure. These are basically the two parameters that we need to trade off against each other: the test duration and the significance level. So um, we can go into all the different costs and benefits that come with a longer tests. So obviously, on the cost side, if you're testing longer, something which is hurting your revenue, we are actually losing revenue during the test. And at the same time, if what you're testing is better, you are leaving money on the table, so to say, the longer you're testing. So these are the trade-offs during the test duration. And then once you implement, comes exploitation. And let's say you expect from the moment you start the test uh, to the moment where you expect like a complete de uh, design overhaul or something like to, to change drastically for the business. Let's say that's three years. Well, if you test for three months, then that leaves you three, uh, two, two years and uh, nine months to nine months. exploit whatever you find. And if you test for six months, then that leaves you just two years and six months. So that's less time to reap the benefits from, from your test. And these are the, the basic trade-offs one needs to have in their head when uh, thinking about uh, the test duration. There is no hard and fast rule about that. Actually, I've uh, designed the whole um, method of assessing what's the optimal balance between the test duration and the significant stress code. And you can actually access that as a tool online. And you can plug in a lot of those business metrics um, and also a few statistical parameters, like let's say the historical or the baseline conversion rate that you expect, like the usual thing you would, you would do to plan a test statistically. And with the business information provided, it will um, output, you know, an optimal design. So an optimal in the sense that it balances the duration of the test with the significance that can be obtained. That is the, the certainty that can be obtained. And that's my solution to this problem. Yeah, it's far from perfect, but I've not seen uh, anything close to it yet. So 
I uh, hope it's going to be useful to to some folk. Yeah, so there's not necessarily a, a one size fits all answer to the to the question: How long should I run a test? And I I, didn't, I don't think anyone can can give such a such an answer. Yeah. Georgie, th- thank you so much for uh, for uh, being on the podcast. We're almost running out of time already. Um, I think I, I feel like we could talk for another hour at least. So you you've been working on uh, obviously you've written a book, you've uh, created the course at CXL, you run analytics toolkit. What are your plans for the upcoming twelve months? What are you working on? Um, actually, I mean, for the past five six years, I've mostly been working on okay, what are the best statistical methods that we can apply to online A/B testing? How do we do it actually in practice? Like how do we overcome practical limitations? Um, this balancing between risk and reward, like optimal risk reward calculations, that has been a major thing for me in the past uh, several years as well. And now I think the more important work ahead for me is making um, sure these ideas can reach the largest base possible, making them easily digestible. So communications, improving the way I can communicate these ideas is actually going to be a major focus for me. Um, Experiments, AI tests, uh, blog posts, and uh, obviously talks like uh, the one that we just had. I yeah. hope would help some people to, you know, have a, have a, have an easier time understanding uh, these quite crucial ideas. I, I would say. And and as a final question, do you have any uh, book recommendations uh, for our audience besides, of course, your own? I, I would say over the past six months, the best book on maybe testing I've read has been uh, Ronnie Kuhavi and. Um, uh, Diane uh, Tang and uh, what's, what was the third author? Um, I think Trustworthy Online Controlled Experiments is the title. Uh, I would highly recommend it. A lot of good advice, a lot of practical examples from obviously uh, Ronnie's uh, vast experience. And yeah, it's a, I think for middle level and above, like y- you have to have some experience with A-B testing to appreciate it. Yeah. If you do, then I think it's going to be valuable for you. Yeah, for for those that don't know, uh, Ronnie, he worked for Microsoft uh, before and uh, now works for Airbnb still, I think. I mean, Airbnb was in, um, they had some layoffs, but I think Ronnie's still, <laughs> Ronnie's still working there. Uh, and yeah, his book, we'll, we'll link to his book in the, in the show notes. And I think it's available on uh, Kindle. I don't think it's an audio book yet, uh, but I think it's definitely on, on Kindle. And of course, the physical uh, form, uh, you can order that. It'll be in the show notes. Yogi, thank you so much for uh, sharing this uh, with all of us. Uh, we'll definitely also link to, to your website, of course, in the show notes if, uh, if people want to uh, learn more uh, about you and they can reach out to you, I think, uh, on uh, LinkedIn, Twitter. What do you prefer if they have any questions? Uh, LinkedIn is best. And thank you for hosting me, Guido. It's been a pleasure and a uh, delight to talk to you today. You're welcome. Thanks so much. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And this concludes Season 2, Episode 30 of the Zero Cafe Podcast with Georgi Georgiev. Although we started out as a Dutch podcast, we are putting out more and more English content. If you want to skip all the Dutch gobbledygook, please go to zero.cafe slash English to see an overview of our English episodes and to subscribe to get notified about new English content. If you're interested in promoting your products or services to the best Zero specialist in the world, please take a look at zero.cafe slash partner to see how we can collaborate. Next week, we'll have another English episode in which we're going to discuss why empathy is probably the most important skill for any Zero professional, and we'll be doing that together with Zero specialist Amardeep Adwal from the UK. Talk to you next episode, and always be optimizing. <laughs>